So, ladies and gentlemen, Vice President and I are very pleased to welcome you to our press conference. We will now report on the outcome of today's meeting of the Governing Council, which was also attended by the Commission Vice President, Mr. Dombrovskis. Based on our regular economic and monetary analysis, we decided to keep the key ECB interest rates unchanged. We continue to expect them to remain at their present levels at least through the summer of 2019, and in any case, for as long as necessary to ensure the continued sustained convergence of inflation to levels that are below but close to 2% over the medium term. Regarding non-standard monetary policy measures, we intend to continue reinvesting in full the principal payments from maturing securities purchased under the Asset Purchase Program for an extended period of time past the date when we start raising the key ECB interest rates, and in any case for as long as necessary to maintain favorable liquidity conditions and an ample degree of monetary accommodation. The incoming information has continued to be weaker than expected on account of softer external demand and some country and sector specific factors. The persistence of uncertainties, in particular relating to geopolitical factors and the threat of protectionism is weighing on economic sentiment. At the same time, supportive financing conditions, favorable labor market dynamics, and rising wage growth continue to underpin the euro area expansion and gradually rise in inflation pressures. This supports our confidence in the continued sustained convergence of inflation to levels that are below but close to 2% over the medium term. Significant monetary policy stimulus remains essential to support the further build-up of domestic price pressures and headline inflation developments over the medium term. This will be provided by our forward guidance on the key ECB interest rates, reinforced by the reinvestments of the sizable stock of acquired assets. In any event, the Governing Council stands ready to adjust all of its instruments as appropriate to ensure that inflation continues to move towards the Governing Council's inflation aim in a sustained manner. Let me now explain our assessment in greater detail, starting with economic analysis. Euro area real GDP increased by 0.2% quarter on quarter in the third quarter of 2018, following growth of 0.4 in the previous two quarters. Incoming data have continued to be weaker than expected as a result of a slowdown in external demand compounded by some country and sector specific factors. While the impact of some of these factors is expected to fade, the near-term growth momentum is likely to be weaker than previously anticipated. Looking ahead, the euro area expansion will continue to be supported by favorable financing conditions, further employment gains and rising wages, lower energy prices, and the ongoing, albeit somewhat slower, expansion in global activity. The risks surrounding the euro area growth outlook have moved to the downside on account of the persistence of uncertainties related to the geopolitical factors and the threat of protectionism, vulnerabilities in emerging markets, and financial market volatility. 
Euro area annual HICP inflation declined to 1.6% to in December 2018 from 1.9% in November, reflecting mainly lower energy price inflation. On the basis of current futures prices for oil, headline inflation is likely to decline further over the coming months. Measures of underlying inflation remain generally muted, but labor cost pressures are continuing to strengthen and broaden amid high levels of capacity utilization and tightening labor markets. Looking ahead, underlying inflation is expected to increase over the medium term, supported by our monetary policy measures, the ongoing economic expansion, and rising wage growth. Turning to the monetary analysis, broad money M3, broad money growth, moderated to 3.7% in November 2018, after 3.9% in October. M3 growth continues to be backed by bank credit creation. The narrow monetary aggregate M1 remained the main contributor to broad money growth. The annual growth rate of loans to non-financial corporations stood at 4% in November 2018 after 3.9% in October while the annual growth rate of loans to households remained broadly unchanged at 3.3%. The Euro Area Bank Lending Survey for the fourth quarter of 2018 suggests that overall bank lending conditions remained favorable, following an extended period of net easing, and demand for bank credit continued to rise, thereby underpinning loan growth. The pass-through of the monetary policy measures put in place since June 2014 continues to significantly support borrowing conditions for firms and households' access to financing, in particular for small and medium-sized enterprises and credit flows across the euro area. To sum up, a cross-check of the outcome of the economic ana analysis with the signals coming from the monetary analysis confirmed that an ample degree of monetary accommodation is still necessary for the continued sustained convergence of inflation to levels that are below but close to 2% over the medium term. In order to reap the full benefits from our monetary policy measures, other policy areas must contribute more decisively to raising the longer term growth potential and reducing vulnerabilities. The implementation of structural reforms in euro area countries needs to be substantially stepped up to increase resilience, reduce structural unemployment, and boost euro area productivity and growth potential. Regarding fiscal policies, the Governing Council reiterates the need for rebuilding fiscal buffers. This is particularly important in countries where government debt is high and for which full adherence to the Stability and Growth Pact is critical for safeguarding sound fiscal positions. Likewise, the transparent and consistent implementation of the EU's fiscal and economic governance framework over time and across countries remains essential to bolster the resilience of the euro area economy. Improving the functioning of the economic and monetary union remains a priority. The Governing Council welcomes the ongoing work and urges further specific and decisive steps to complete the banking union and the capital markets union. And now we are at your disposal for questions. Piers Kalimowski, uh, Bloomberg. Uh, my first question would, relates to your assessment, the risk of move to the downside. What sort of implication that will have for your policy, and especially for your forward guidance? And my second question, um, you told us in December that um, at some point you will ask committees okay. to, um, to start work on Teltros. Um, have they already been put to work? Have they been tasked with, um, with looking into Teltros? Thank you. Thank you. 
Well, today we didn't discuss the implications. Today's meeting uh, was m essentially devoted to an assessment. Uh, where are we? And um, why are we here? Um, how long will the slowdown last? Is the slowdown going to worse or stay as a, as a shallow, lower path? These were the questions that were asked. And on the second question, um, we several speakers actually uh, raised this issue, but no decision was taken. So it was because we didn't discuss policies this time. We only were focused on the assessment. Quite clearly, the assessment will have implications about policy, but we didn't discuss them. Mr. Karani. Thank you, uh, Balash Koranyi from Reuters. Two questions as usual, Mr. President. Um, given that data have disappointed on the downside fairly consistently since your last meeting, what gives you confidence that your, your economic assessment is actually correct and there's going to be a rebound? And my second question is quite similar, which is about core inflation. You pre predicted a vigorous rise in core inflation towards the end of last year. It didn't happen and it's still not happening. Again, what gives you confidence that your assessment is correct? Um, it's, um, it's basically one question, really. And uh, you see, underlying inflation has been muted. It's been moving sideways. It's higher than the low levels that reached about a year ago. And uh, it does, uh, what is, on what our confidence is based, uh, um, it, it is based on the continuation of the economic expansion. It is based on uh, the strong labor market performance, though it's slowing down. It's based on uh, the uh, encouraging pickup in wages. Nominal wage growth has gone up, uh, especially, of course, in the core countries and especially in Germany. Uh, both compensation per employee and negotiated wages show a pickup, consistent, significant pickup. So the issue is, so we see all these components moving in the right direction. And uh, so the, the question is, why haven't they passed through? Why aren't they being passed through into higher prices? And what, what we are observing is that the, there is a profit squeeze. So it's a matter of time uh, that, of course, this pass through will happen. First, in the parts of the Eurozone where the labor market is stronger, unemployment is lower, especially in some countries where basically there is full employment. And then gradually we'll expand to other countries. That is what really gives us, and then of course, the financing conditions and our monetary policy that remains fully accommodative strengthens our confidence in this, in this process. Um, Annette Weisbach, CNBC. I have two questions. Um, you were saying that your, your, this meeting was um, more or less for the assessment of where we stand when it comes to the economy and uh, how long the potential downturn will last. So how long will it last in your view? And another question is um, whether you're happy with what the market is pricing in in terms of interest rate um, hike, because now the market is only pricing in the first hike in 2020, and you're still guiding us uh, more or less for like the fall period of this year. So what's your view here? Is the market right, or do you need to upgrade or update us on your forward guidance? Thank you very much. OK, uh, since you're all asking, let me give you a summary of the meeting now. So. <laughs> First of all, um, what you care most, uh, were we unanimous? OK, we were unanimous about uh, acknowledging the weaker momentum and uh, uh, changing the balance of risk for growth. We're all uh, in agreement on that. And we were unanimous in assessing the factors that have caused the slowdown. Namely, first and foremost, there is an increase in general uncertainty this increase in general uncertainty is being produced by the threats of protectionism, 
doubts were it, actually m extensive doubts about the 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 multilateral rules that have have underpinned our growth since uh, since the second world war the uh, protracted uh, and unclear outcome the protracted negotiations and the unclear and their unclear outcome yet about brexit and of course, the implications that this might have. I've said many times that uh, if you compare the potential disruption coming from Brexit for the aggregate of the euro area, well, just looking at, at aggregate numbers, uh, it doesn't seem to be uh, to be uh, an extensive disruption. But we have to take into account things like value chains, and we have to also to take into account the some countries are more exposed, of course, to to, to events in the Brexit. Case. So we, we follow that. But that just is a sign of a contribution to the increase in, uh, in general uncertainty. And then, of course, we have the political developments in, uh, in, some, uh, in some countries in the Eurozone. This is one set of, uh, of factors. There is another set of factors that is specific factors that are specific to uh, certain countries. And, um, and this is, has to do with the slowdown in China, and the waning effects of fiscal package in the United States, and the car industry in Germany. So all this, uh, it's a pretty long list of factors. So the issue is now, and that's again, uh, there was um, unanimity in saying that the key aspect to assess is the persistence of the general uncertainty as being produced by these factors. And uh, this certainly, if, if, this, if all this were to persist, uh, we should expect a, a longer, uh, a longer uh, weak momentum beyond the near term. So, and then finally, there was also quite, an, I would say, unanimity about assessing the likelihood of a recession as being low. Now, again, we, I don't want to give numbers here, but some of them are very low. Others are on the average since the last uh, 60 years or 50 years. Uh, so in any event, pretty low. Of course, again, uh, in, a, in, a, in an area like the Eurozone, uh, these, these estimates uh, ought to be taken with some caution, because if you have a recession, serious recession in one part of the Eurozone, that can spread to other parts. But basically, there was unanimity about assessing this likelihood as low. Um, also, why this is, why was it low? Because conditions, financing conditions continue to be uh, basically very favorable. Uh, developments in the labor market continue to be positive. Nominal wage growth continues to con continues to be uh, significant, and uh, of course the lower energy prices support uh, disposable income, real disposable income for households. But also there is another factor to keep in mind uh, that makes the present situation different from uh, from uh, the situation we had at the beginning of the great financial crisis. That this time. Banks' balance sheets are much stronger than they were before the crisis. Uh, now, of course, we have local episodes of weakness, but by and large, the banking sector is much stronger than it was at the beginning of the crisis. So uh, the, um, the uh, conditions for a continuation of credit to the economy are in place. Um, then the discussion focused on, uh, on persistence. Again, then there were two viewpoints. For some, as usual, uh, for some, um, China, uh, the, the slowdown in China won't last long because we have confidence, and we do have confidence, in the, in the government's measures. And everything we know is, uh, looks, uh, says that the government is actually taking strong measures to address the slowdown. The trade disputes will, va will wane. Um, in the end, the Brexit thing will not affect the EU economy that much. But especially, the, uh, there was one aspect of the discussion, is that all these uncertainties, all these risks, are being addressed by the policy response of the authorities in these countries. 
so in um, in and, and and the and the specific episode of the car industry in Germany will uh, soon uh, wane out because there is going to be a rebound in the sector. One thing that basically, of course, we all agree is that uh, if there is going to be clarity on the exports and the trade sector, much of what we are seeing today in terms of weakness will very likely uh, wash out. Others, however, for others, however, the downside movement in all industries, in all indicators, both hard and soft, has lasted now several quarters. And all these risk factors are not going to disappear, and they are affecting confidence. So you see, these are the two perspectives in the assessment of persistence, having agreed about everything else. So the conclusion of all this is that the governing council will give itself more time to assess whether all these risk factors have affected confidence. And we are going to have another discussion in March when we'll also have the new projections. Now, about inflation, of course, the, uh, going back to the first, the other question I had, focused in on, first of all, on headline inflation, where clearly it's being driven by oil prices mostly, but also from, by food and services prices to much lesser extent, and, uh, and uh, uh, on underlying inflation. And here I've answered to, I basically gave you the sense of the discussion in answering your question. Um, now, of course, if this momentum were to last uh, long, uh, and uh, if the convergence were to happen uh, around growth potential or even below growth potential, of course, the time that will take for the, for the inflation to converge to our aim and objective will be longer. Uh, but all throughout this, and, and again, uh, there was um, there was uh, agreement about the monetary policy being, that has been accommodative, very accommodative. Even though we stopped the net asset purchase, it wasn't a tightening, as some people have said. Actually, it's been very accommodative for a variety of reasons. The term structure curve the, uh, flattened. The term premium is negative. And, um, and, so, and so even the discount component to stock prices has contributed to stock prices. To keep them uh, to keep them higher, and most importantly, liquidity conditions are abundant, and will remain abundant. So, as I said, several speakers mentioned the Teltro, and um, and that's it. I'm sorry. Which was? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, you see, the, uh, I was asked the same question last time. I'm not sure it was you, but uh, um, the, um, the fact that the market, it, let's go back to our forward guidance and says, um, uh, we intend to continue reinvesting in full the principal payments from maturity. Um, no, the other part of the forward guidance is we continue to expect the inter key ECB interest rates to remain at their present levels, at least through the summer of 2019, and in any case, for as long as necessary, to ensure the continued sustained convergence of inflation. So it's both date and state contingent. When markets place the first rate hike in 2020, they are, they are using the state uh, contingent part of our forward guidance. They assess the economic prospects that way, and they, it shows that they have understood our reaction function. And in so doing, in, uh, in the flattening of the yield curve that has taken place continuously, by the way, since we announced the end of the net asset purchases starting in June last year, they are providing accommodation through that, through that uh, channel. Of course, we have to assess then uh, the developments, and uh, if this persistence will continue, we'll have to validate this indication. But at this point in time, we we'll just assess the situation. Mr. Fellis. Thank you, Tom Fellis from the Wall Street Journal. Um, I had a question about negative rates and the persistence. Um, I suppose negative rates have been in place for three or four years now, and uh, you're. Uh, 
four, four years? No, you know better, I'm saying. <laughs> <laughs> you know more than we do. And um, if markets are correct that negative rates would continue for another year and a half, would the ECB need to do anything to mitigate that? I think in last month, last time you, you mentioned that you were concerned about the impact on banks. Um, w would there be a way to introduce a tiered deposit rate, for instance, or to uh, a limited interest rate hike? Um, and my second question is um, on who else could be helping out if the, if the weakness continues? Um, how much of the onus will be on governments, and in particular Germany, I suppose, which is the, 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 the big country that has got uh, fiscal, fiscal space um, to ta cut taxes or to increase spending? Thank you. Thank you. Well, we have to see, uh, I mean, to, to, I'll answer the second question first. Uh, we, we have to see first how protracted this slowdown is going to be, how persistent these the factors that have originated this slowdown are going to be. And this applies to fiscal policy as well. By the way, fiscal policy in the euro area now is slightly expansionary, certainly more expansionary than last year. And this is true in Germany, but also true in many other countries, if not all countries, I think, of the euro area in their draft budgetary plans are presenting expansions. Um, on, the, on the, the first point, let me just go back about what I think I said last time. Um, negative interest rates affect negatively the net interest margin. And uh, that's almost a tautology, but especially because uh, interest on deposit is set to zero. But when we look at their effect, the effect of negative interest rates, which, by the way, have been a very effective monetary policy measure, and it is an effective monetary policy measure now. It remains so. So when we look at the effect of negative rates on, uh, on, uh, on profitability of the aggregate of the banking sector, we see that, by and large, the positive effects of the recovery generated by the more accommodative, more expansionary monetary policy produced by the negative rates compensate, offset each other. And we'll have to see now how will con the continuation of negative rates will affect this balance. But, but let me also add another factor. That profitability in the Eurozone, pr bank's profitability, is affected I would say in many cases much more significantly by factors like cost coverage ratios that in some countries are way, way above any, any average. By the presence of stocks of non-performing loans that by all accounts are way above any average. Uh, by overcrowding. So there are structural and uh, business model specific factors that affect the overall profitability. And it's in this sense that I said we will continue to monitor the uh, profitability of the banking sector very, very closely. And what I just said shows how important this is. Because that's one of the main, difference between, uh, main differences between now and the situation we had before the crisis. The main difference is that banks are strong now, or at least stronger, certainly stronger than they were before the crisis. And this is a key for making sure that any downturn in growth doesn't transform itself into a recession. Ms. Jones? Um, Claire Jones, Financial Times. Um, Mr. Draghi, you're joining the Federal Reserve today in acknowledging some of the concerns that people have over the, the, um, the global economic outlook, but I think the Fed has also been clear that it's going to react to that by doing probably less rate hikes this year, um, whereas even though the, the, the balance of risks has changed today, um, there's not so much of a sense about how exactly you're going to react to that. So would it be possible for maybe you to spell out a little bit about what you see your reaction function as being? For instance, how would you weigh up the Teltros? Are they something distinct to a, to a maintenance of a loosening stance? Are they more about 
dealing with liquidity in the banking system and how important is the forward guidance on rates vis-a-vis -vis the, the forward guidance on reinvestments. And just a quick second question, if I may. Um, the bank lending survey seemed to point to a tightening um, an anticipation of a tightening in demand for credit over the, the coming quarter. So how much of a concern is that? Thank you. Thank you. Um, the, the, I'll answer the second question. You're right, it does point to a tightening, very, I mean, slight tightening. But the result of that uh, figure is mostly centered in Italy. Uh, so it's a tightening that's not spread to the rest of the Eurozone. On, um, on, on the, the other question, well, we are still in the assessment mode. And, uh, and today's meeting was about that, not so much the policy mode. But let me say at the very beginning that the nature of our forward guidance, which is both, it, it is date, but it's also state contingent, has already produced a reaction in terms of increasing the degree of accommodation of our monetary policy. And uh, it's been producing this reaction over the last several months, flattening the curve, and going and producing all the effects I mentioned before. Now, uh, what is next? Next will depend on whether we will end up assessing this as lower growth as, or the factors that have produced this lower growth as persistent. And then we will consider different contingencies and different elements. And, and of course, I don't want to speculate about uh, what contingency would call for a specific instrument. But if you look at the number of instruments we have in place now, it, we can conclude that it's not true that the ECB has run out of fuel or has run out of instruments. We have all our toolbox still available. Thank you. Alessandro Barbera, La Stampa. Uh, Mr. President, you just said that um, you didn't take a decision about the new uh, TLTRO um, for banks, but I'd like to ask you if you think they should be useful for banks, and what do you think, uh, what do you answer to the German economist who's saying that a new TLTRO should be a, a gift, a subsidy for Italian and Spanish banks? Thank you. Now, Eltros and Teltros, both of them, have been very useful and very effective. Very effective in restoring transmission of monetary policy across the Euro area. You remember when they were implemented, the Eltros was uh, 2012, the Teltros came later, they were more targeted to lending, but they've been unquestionably effective. So what, uh, in, a, in a somewhat more, uh, more, more, I would say, polite way, what these, what these economists are saying is, um, if, you, um, if we are to do Teltros, they should, there should be a good case for monetary policy. In other words, we, don't want, we want to have Teltros or Eltros to address cases of uh, existing or likely fragmentation in the monetary policy space. In other words, we don't want to be again in the situation where we were in 2012, 13, and 14, where we lowered the interest rates, policy interest rates, and this was not translated into lower lending rates. And uh, so if that's necessary, we'll do whatever is necessary for, uh, to, to address this point. It's not it, it, it's, it's actually, it's the, what they are saying is that there must be a case of monetary policy for doing it. So it shouldn't be something that we do it as, uh, as a, and they're right, I mean, as a, as a sectoral uh, measure, as a country-based measure. Mr. Stumpf. Thank you, Andres Estum from Expansion. I would like to know uh, which uh, concrete instruments do you have to, uh, to adjust in, in case of a weaker scenario. You said you had the full toolbox, but, but 
some have been in place yet and uh, already. And uh, then I would like to ask uh, about the situation of the illegal phone tapping that uh, it surrounds the former uh, president of BBVA in Spain. I would like to know the ECB position about and it, it, if, if it uh, can do anything if uh, there's a reputational, reputational risk for the bank. Thank you. Thank you. I have answered to the first question already. Um, some of, our, some, some of our instruments have already been playing their accommodative role in the past few months. Uh, others may be acted depending on the evolution of, the, uh, of growth and uh, of the factors that have originally produced this lower momentum. Uh, on the second question, I, I would ask the Vice President to respond. Uh, with respect to the second question, as uh, you perfectly know, uh, BBVA has launched an investigation, an internal investigation that is underway. And today it has announced that uh, it has started also a, a sort of forensic uh, probe that is going to be conducted by a third party. And I think that we have to wait for the, for the, for the conclusions of these probes and these investigations. Uh, we expect that the conclusions will be available as soon as possible because in this kind of circumstances, time is of the essence. Mr. Tsudra. Markus Tsudra, Süddeutsche Zeitung. Uh, the German government is clearly favoring a merger of Deutsche Bank and Commerzbank. And so what is your take on that from a supervisor's perspective? Would you oppose that plan? I'm sorry, I can't answer this question. I'm not commenting on individual institutions. Mr. Bondermann. Thank you. Um, Mr. Draghi, you just said the whole toolbox is still in place, but uh, in case a downturn uh, were to become a real recession with serious negative effects on inflation, um, would the ECB have enough policy space to respond with interest rates already at zero or sub-zero and with uh, QE already having reached its limits, the capital key and the, the issue limit? Thank you. Well, you see, we, we, uh, when I said we still have uh, instruments in our toolbox, uh, uh, first of all, Let's go back to when we announced the end of the net asset purchases, which was June last year. At that point in time, we, 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 we actually, we decided to, <clears throat> to, well, there are several things. We decided to stabilize the existing stock. The stock of bonds we own is not indifferent. It's pretty big. It's more specifically, it's 25% of total government debt and eligible universe now. So to stabilize, and, and, uh, to stabilize the stock by itself does require purchases of bonds every month, which this year is about of the order of 15 billion euros which was, by and large, the same amount we were purchasing on a net basis until December. But the important thing for judging, and the result of, important thing for judging uh, whether this is uh, contractionary or is accommodative, is the stock relative to the volume of bonds, and I said it's 25%, but also the evolution and we don't expect the stock of government bonds to increase in the future. As a matter of fact, the stock of government bonds has been declining since 2014 in the aggregate of the Eurozone. Of course, we have exceptions, but what matters for, from, the, from our viewpoint is the aggregate of the Eurozone. So the stock of long, the volume of long-term bonds is, um, is, not, is not growing. And we expect it falling until 2021 by and large by 6%. So the pressure on rates will be less and less by itself. 
and which also says that liquidity will remain very abundant well into the next decade. So when you come, uh, when you go and measure uh, this, uh, you see what I think was I said before, when you look at the risk-free rates across maturities, you see both the level and the shape of the term structure, they've gone down, they've flattened the, the term structure and the level has been going down. Now, 10-year bonds are now lower by 20 basis points since June, and rates kept on going down. So by itself, this provides accommodation. Now, the, so then the rest I think I've, I've said. Now, of course, the spreads is a different issue. The spreads in different countries or for certain segments of the bond market have evolved depending on specific sectoral or country conditions. Mr. Vivo. But of course, let me, let me finish. We, so we, we have a long list of instruments now. We have the reinvestment. We have the forward guidance state based. We have the APP. We have Teltro. We have lots of instruments. And we stand ready to adjust them and use them according to the contingency that is, uh, is produced. Frank Wiebe, Handelsblatt. Uh, just another topic. Is there any news about a possible successor for uh, Sabine Lautenschläger and her function as a supervisor? Do you have anything for us? No. No, I'm okay. sorry, not yet. But you will know it. Well, we have to yeah. ask. You will know it soon. No, no. Uh, Mr. Heiden, please. Just... Uh, Luke Heisen, Market News. Mr. Jaggi, have your views on the scale of the potential downside risks from Brexit evolved since last week's House of Commons defeat for Theresa May? Would you expect your assessment of those risks to change in the event of a general election in the UK? And my second question was, could the same issues that suggest a first interest rate hike may be delayed well beyond this summer also have the potential to be positive risks? For example, if we get a soft Brexit, a US-China trade detente, or as you suggested it will, China responds well to the government's stimulus measures. Should the markets also prepare themselves for the surprise of a rate hike this year? Thank you. Well, the first question is definitely too difficult for me. I can't answer that question because I, I just wouldn't know. Um, now, the, the second question is, in a sense, the, the, uh, the account I gave you of the debate of the discussion we had in the Governing Council answers this question. Uh, the, uh, one, one part of the participants uh, doesn't, let me put it this way, doesn't exclude, because we are not yet at the level of having certainties, but doesn't exclude a all, all in all, a more benign outcome. Uh, and another part would, uh, is, is, is closer to exclude this and just, uh, uh, and just uh, work for the downside. So it's, um, and, and, and therefore, the, the consequences of this discussion will reverberate in the market rates. Ms. Laird? The mic is coming here. Thank you. You spoke a number of times about your optimism that tightening labor markets and rising wages will help inflation converge toward the ECB's target. We've seen tightness in the labor market in the US for some time now with very little resulting inflationary pressure. So what makes you think that the Eurozone uh, wage recovery will be different than what we've seen in the US? Well, actually, it's not that different because in, in the U.S. you've seen inflation hovering around 2%. Uh, so it means that it's taken uh, a several number of years. In mind, the U.S. is more advanced than we are in the, in the, rec in the business cycle, really. So it's taken uh, several number of years in the U.S. to have this pass through from wages into prices. And so I would expect that if it takes the same number of years, we may be there as well. But it's it's been uh, inflation is not it's not far from the from the from the target in the U.S. Thank you, Mr. Dimitrio. Uh, 
the Federal Reserve uh, starting rising rates in the uh, here. <laughs> oh, okay. The Federal Reserve started uh, rising rates in uh, 2015. Uh, the European Central Bank may do so after the summer. Uh, the time gap is uh, four years. Does the European Central Bank believe that this distance will be reduced or the divergence of growth between the two economies, US and Europe, is structural? This is the first question. The second question is, a European government uh, at, has attacked the vigilance of the European Central Bank, uh, um, saying it is impartial. How does the uh, uh, European Central Bank comment? Thank you, thank you. Uh, the timing of monetary policy actions in all jurisdictions is dictated by the respective positions, by the positions of the economies in the respective business cycles. Uh, structural differences may play, uh, may, may make a difference, but you know structural differences were there before and are gonna stay there later. It's hard to understand how they can influence, but certainly they may have an effect. So it's, um, it's, it's hard to say, it's hard to project these uh, different in difference in dates to different business, but we have to keep in mind that once we are at the same stage with the labor market, the same degree of tightness everywhere in the Eurozone, because one, one feature of the Eurozone is its heterogeneity. In some parts of the Eurozone, we have no doubt these parts are at full employment and have been at full employment for a while. So much so that if anything, the obstacles to higher growth are now to be found in the scarcity of labor or in the scarcity of skilled labor or in the, in the capacity of the plant and equipment. But in other parts of the Eurozone, unemployment is still high, significantly high. And so you have slack there, so you have lower wage momentum, you have lower demand, which hampers the pricing capacity of firms and therefore the pass through into, into higher price. So it's, it's heterogeneous. And that's one thing to keep in mind. Now, um, you know, on various occasions, various governments have attacked uh, both supervision but also monetary policy. Uh, all of you can't, I mean, certainly remember other instances where, uh, where the ECB monetary policy was being publicly criticized by prominent, prominent politicians. As I said, it's, uh, it's understandable that uh, when things go, don't go their way, uh, the politicians would uh, protest and say what they want. It's also understandable that the uh, ECB doesn't listen. <laughs> Mr. Powell. Hi, Matthias Powell, RTLZ. Uh, you've spoken at some length about uh, the rising uncertainties. And now one obvious uncertainty is uh, who will succeed you. Um, is there a sense in uh, the governing council that the process of finding a successor should be expedited? Well, I, you know, it's, it's a difficult answer. I'm a little biased. I have, don't have that sense. Maybe, maybe people like me. <laughs> it's a, but I don't have that sense from the governing council. Of course, people know that uh, the mandate is about to end. But we have no say about that, you know? It's, uh, it's, it's decided by other people. Well, I mean, these processes have always been like, uh, they've always been decided by other people in other fora, and uh, central bankers have no say about that. So we, we wait for the decisions taken by, by the European Council, by the, uh, by the Eurogroup. Thank you. Um, Ms. Bufaki. 
Isabella Bufaki from Sole 24 Ore. I have uh, two questions. You did mention uh, a recession a few times and that it's low risk, but I wonder whether you would like to comment on any way risk we went really close to, or maybe we are into a technical recession for Germany and Italy. Whether um, you looked at that in particular, whether you thought that the factors uh, in Germany were mostly temporary, but maybe for Italy they were more deeply rooted. And then you also said that the bank's balance sheets are much stronger. Anyway, market capitalization of major European banks is very low. And um, there are some, as you said, isolated cases, but troubled cases um, for banks in Italy and Germany. And uh, recently, the ECB SSM has increased its pressure on requirements for NPL provisioning. And we have now flows and also stocks, what uh, seems to be called the Daniel Nui package, uh, also on legacy assets. So uh, would you care to comment on that, given that I see the discussion on TLTROs is not started, but maybe there is uh, an issue, not of liquidity, but maybe market access of certain banks. Thank you. Well, I said, I said they are strong, banks are stronger in comparison with, with uh, what they were, or how they were at the beginning of the great financial crisis. Of course, banks can be stronger, but if you look at the capital ratios today, they are much higher than they were in uh, 2006. But also risk management, uh, controls, the overall uh, banking sector has uh, in response, partly in response to, uh, to the regulation, partly in response to their own, uh, the, the, a change in their own business practices, uh, is, uh, is stronger than it was before. Given that, we certainly know that we have, uh, as I mentioned before, in a different context, we have cost coverage ratios, which are above uh, any, uh, in some parts of the Eurozone, are above uh, any comparator. Uh, we have NPL stocks, which are high. And that, wh what you said actually shows the case for a speedy uh, elimination of NPL stocks, uh, because it, d it does strengthen the economies against, against a recession. It, it does uh, ensure the uh, people of these countries that a recession doesn't become again a credit crunch, which worsens the recession again, which was the experience in, in the great financial crisis. So the, uh, I don't know much about the, frankly, about the uh, Nui, Daniel Nui package. And, uh, and so you, these questions you'll have to ask to Enria. Maybe he has an Enria package to propose that. But uh, I don't know much about that. Now, on the possibility of recessions in Germany and Italy, I think I've, I've discussed that. Right now, the governing council doesn't assess this as a likely possibility. And as I said, likelihood of recessions changes from different parts of the, of the Eurozone. But overall, in the aggregate, uh, there, is, um, there was, was no, no sense that the recession was a likely event. Mr. Boll. Hi. Uh, Thomas Bollen from Follow the Money. Um, the Dutch uh, Scientific Council for Government Advice in the Netherlands has performed a three-year research into the monetary system. And um, they concluded that the lack of a digital alternative for cash money is contributing to um, instability in the financial uh, system. And they advised uh, the foundation of, of a full reserve bank or giving uh, the public access directly to central bank uh, reserves or access to um, uh, central bank digital currency. Um, my question is whether the foundation of such a full reserve bank is possible within the current uh, regulatory framework and whether the ECB is considering experiments with central bank digital currency. The um, answer to the second question is no, we are not considering experiments experiments in this field. Um, to the first question, there is a vast amount of work that's taking place across different central banks and uh, centered in the BIS, the Bank for International Settlements. Um, 
But uh, to say that this would lead to a change of this importance anytime soon would be, would be wrong, would be an exaggeration. Actually, rather the opposite is true. It's rather the risks of movements th like that, which, which by the way, I, I know that in some countries have been, uh, have been asked by, by the public, and in some countries, uh, some countries, not many, very few as a matter of fact, are close to doing something like that. Uh, but the, the studies that have the work that has been done highlights more the risks of an approach like that for monetary policy, for the banking system, for financial stability, than the benefits. But that's, the, that's a snapshot of how things stand at this point in time. And the final question to Mrs. Van Leuven at the back. Uh, Mr. Draghi, question from uh, for BNR News Radio in the Netherlands. Um, today, new pension cuts have been announced, and um, I was wondering what what would you like to say to those people who fear their savings uh, due to pension cuts and and low interest. I'm sorry, I'm not in a position to comment on this. Thank you. Thank you very much. Is there any other question? Because I promised one more minute, so it's just... We can do a second round if you want. <laughs> no, that's another... Well, then there's one there. Please. <laughs> You said, uh, Julia Wackett from Börsenzeitung, you said in your introductory remarks that um, steps to strengthen the Eurozone architecture have to substantially be stepped up. But how do you feel the chances of this, given that all the major countries are facing so big domestic issues right now? Actually, the word, if I'm correct, the word stepped up was used for structural reforms, but the conclusion is the same. Whether you talk about structural reforms or progress in economic and monetary union building, deepening, uh, the pace has slowed down considerably. And, uh, and, and the reason, basically, is that these are big, important changes. And uh, therefore, they need the support of the people. And so in, uh, we, we uh, I think I said it on another occasion, in, in, the, in both these areas, we've got to be a humble. Our, we can design what's the optimal uh, set of measures to take. In, in, all, I mean, in all cases, we made the examples of structural reforms or, or economic monetary union deepening. But then the timing of the implementation of these measures is an entirely political decision. And so uh, I have no doubt about the political commitment by our leaders, by our governments, by most of our citizens. You've seen the euro is now has an approval rate as highest since its beginning. So I have no doubt about the political commitment uh, on deepening the economic and monetary union, but I have no say on its timing. Thank you. We have two minutes left. If there's any further questions. One, One. absolutely. One. <laughs> I'm sorry. Mr. McHugh. Dave McHugh, AP. In case there is a no deal Brexit, what could the ECB do to help? Can you give a peek in the toolbox or say anything about that? Well, you know that uh, um, we, we've, been, uh, we've been working with the Bank of England now for several months. We cooperate actively. We had a working group identifying uh, what the main risk could be, could materialize in the financial system, of course. And we identified several uh, areas for action. One, the, uh, the potentially the most important one, is the area of centrally clear derivatives. And, uh, but then the commission intervened with a pronouncement, basically allowing the UK central clearing um, um, central CCPs uh, to continue serving EU clients and members for a period, if I'm not mistaken, of 12 months. Uh, this is called uh, conditional and temporary and conditional equivalence. So the 
This and the other, the other areas of non-centrally clear derivatives, insurance contracts, have, they do present risks, but uh, they can be addressed and they are being addressed by the private sector. So work has been done in the, in the financial sector to be prepared. Of course, we have to see, I mean, because it's, uh, it's such a, it, it, it's an important event and, and, it's, uh, it, and uh, it's, due, it's length, also it's protracted length of time also is, uh, is, not, uh, is not benefiting the overall economic climate uh, in the UK, but also, also in the Euro area. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you very much.